Thank you for that. I mean, it is truly an honor to stand here with Senator Ted Cruz. You know, the problem today in America is not the presence of darkness. The problem is the absence of light. How many of you are thankful for men like Senator Ted Cruz that will stand up and shine the light? Amen. Now is the time for us to face our fears. I remember when HGTV offered us this big contract and before we signed their long form for them, they had to do a, a background check on my brother and I. They had to vet us. They said, hey guys, the attorneys at HGTV, uh, they're, they're excited to have you guys, but they've got one question. They want to know this, are you guys anti-gay? We said we could lose our show. Who knows what you may lose if you have to stand. God had just given us a promise of this platform. Now, if I could just answer this properly, nuance my speech maybe a little bit, I could continue in my, you know, to keep my convictions, but I can also keep my show. But by God's grace, within a matter of about 10 to 15 seconds, I said the right thing. I said, no, we're not anti-anything. We're pro-Jesus, which means we're pro-Bible. We're pro-marriage between a man and a woman. It's funny. We say we're two of the most dangerous men in America. We eat at Chick-fil-A. We shop at Hobby Lobby. We watch Duck Dynasty. We graduated from Liberty University. And now we're here supporting Ted, Ted Cruz. Praise God. I've been asked to, to lead in prayer. Lord, I pray that there would be a spirit of courage that goes out from this place and shakes the nation. I pray for your people today, God, that you would give us hearts of compassion and backbones of steel. We will stand tall, we will stand strong, and we will not be ashamed of the testimony of Jesus. And we pray for Senator Cruz. Lord, we believe you've raised him up for such a time as this. We pray for your very best. We commit the speakers to you, this rally to you. Be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I am encouraged by what I see happening in this generation. And I want to thank my good friend, Ted Cruz, for talking about religious freedom. Religious freedom is essential to who we are as Americans. But we can no longer assume that all of our fellow Americans shame, share that same conviction. Therefore, we must now engage in the fight of our lives to keep this essential freedom. It has become in the hands of an aggressive secular state a drive to push people of faith out of the public square. It is no longer a call to genuine freedom, but an attempt to quarantine our religious freedom within the walls of our churches. They want religion to be out of sight, out of mind, out of influence when it comes to public policy. Why? Because it is an enemy of the all-encompassing secular state. Religious liberty was never merely a procedural right, an island of private belief meant to be isolated from our public duties. The conviction that our inalienable rights, which gives form and definition to constitutional government, come directly from the God who made us and was explicitly detailed in the Declaration of Independence. The call today is for all of us to recognize and affirm that there can be no liberty in America without religious liberty. We must, we must be willing to champion our convictions wherever we work, wherever we live, no matter who attacks us. My friends, we must have no fear. Let me say at the offset, I stand before you not as an African-American, I am an American, an American. If we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we must agree that there is one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God who is in all and over all and through all and that there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we're pursuing. The liberty, the right to worship God as he has called us to worship him. And the First Amendment to the Constitution is the most fundamental because it means that we have a God-given right, 
a God-given right. I never thought I'd see the day when the government of my beloved country would actually punish people for believing what the Bible teaches. And may I say, my friends, no matter what the government or anybody says, when I pray, I will pray in the name of Jesus Christ. No matter how dark it looks, we're going to win because America is indeed a providential nation. We're going to win because if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. My name is Kelly Shackelford, and I've been doing religious liberty cases for over 26 years. I have to be honest with you. In the over quarter century that I've been fighting for religious freedom, I've never seen anything like what I'm seeing right now. Cases include everything from a little five-year-old girl who was praying over her meal and was ordered by a school official to stop and told, quote, it's not good to pray at school, to a case where senior citizens were threatened with having their meals taken away because they were praying over their federally funded meals and federal officials said that would violate separation of church and state. Our founding fathers called religious freedom our first freedom. They did so not just because it's the first two clauses of the First Amendment, but because they knew if you lose your religious freedom, you'll lose all your freedoms. If anyone has the background, the commitment, and the understanding to cover this issue, it's Ted Cruz. God bless you, Ted Cruz, and thank you for hosting this very important rally. You've met some wonderful people, and now you're going to meet some other heroes this evening. Starting off with Angela Hildebrand, valedictorian of her Texas high school in 2011, was threatened with jail if she exercised her right to pray during her graduation speech. And second, I'd like to welcome Pastor David Welch of Texas. Pastor Welch was among the five pastors whose sermons and personal communications pertaining to homosexuality were subpoenaed by the mayor of Houston. Now meet Coach Joe Kennedy. Joe is an assistant football coach in Bremerton, Washington, was recently placed on leave by a school district for silently praying on the field. He's currently barred from participating in any activities related to the high school football program. And last, but very far from least, Dick and Betty Ogart. Dick and Betty declined to host a same-sex wedding ceremony in an historic chapel that they owned, and a complaint was filed with the Iowa Civil Rights Commission. The Oakgarts were forced to settle, paid thousands of dollars in fines, and as a result, have had to close their wedding business. Angela, we'll start with you, since you're just about to graduate from college. Angela, what did you want to tell your classmates on that day when you were celebrated as the leader of the class? I knew that the Lord was giving me a platform to be able to um, have a, a really beautiful opportunity to share with my peers some of the hope and some of the joy that I have received from being in right relation with Christ. After it had been ruled that there would not be able to be any invocation, any uh, benediction, and that um, any speaker who said the words, Amen, Lord, in Jesus' name, or even the word prayer, would be incarcerated, but that if you so desired, you could kneel to face Mecca or wear a yarmulke. After hearing just such an outrageous ruling that the judge went so far, not only to strip um, Christians of their First Amendment rights, but to distinguish and to go so far as to say, this religion is okay, but this is not. That was, I knew as soon as I heard that, that, um, that it was not okay, and that I needed to, to make a stand for the Lord. The Spirit of God goes before you and is alive within you, and the Lord will be faithful to supply and to provide everything that you could possibly need for whatever challenges you're facing. So my advice to you as a friend and as a fellow believer is to just please be courageous. We need you. David Welch, you're a pastor. So you had a very unusual situation. You actually had a mayor who had sermons subpoenaed. Not just you, but four other pastors. What in the world was this about? Well, the, the, 
five of us that were subpoenaed were simply part of a much larger team of hundreds of pastors in Houston that had risen up to oppose the mayor on a policy issue that had to file a lawsuit because the mayor trampled on the law and violated the voting rights of the citizens. So they, we had filed a lawsuit to restore those rights in the midst of all this, uh, reached out and subpoenaed the pastors on 17 different categories of information, not just sermons, sermon notes, sermon materials, texts, emails, all communications with our congregations regarding the mayor, the ordinance, or even homosexuality. Something pretty intriguing happened along the way. The mayor actually sent out a tweet, basically the effect of pastors are involved in politics, their sermons are fair game. Think about this. Their sermons are fair game. Well, what we have to remember is when we place people in public office who reject the law of God, they're certainly going to have no respect for the law of man. So lawlessness is simply part of who they are. And this mayor acted that out. And when she saw us simply engaging with, first of all, what pastors are called to do, and secondly, what we certainly have the right under the Constitution to do, uh, then the rule of law had no effect on her reaching into the pulpits and using the threat of criminal punishment to try to silence the pastors. Again, thank God uh, it did not work. Dick and Betty, you were so generous to join us in Iowa as well. For the benefit of those who have, um, were not with us in Iowa, you were approached by someone interested in having a same-sex wedding on your property. How did you react and why? Uh, we, we responded according to our faith, and, and, that, and that faith is uh, marriages between one man and one woman. When the Oak Arts declined to host a same-sex wedding ceremony in the historic chapel, a complaint was filed with the Iowa Civil Rights Commission. The Oak Arts were forced to settle, paid thousands of dollars in fines, and as a result, closed their wedding business. It was hard to live through, but I'll tell you that I would do it all over again because God has blessed us. Yes, amen. amen. Okay. The blessings have been so tremendous, and God has just walked every step of the way. And I would encourage anybody else who, who is thinking of caving, call me. I'll walk <laughs> you through it, because I would not do it any other way. Coach Joe Kennedy, <laughs> you had quite an adventure. and This seems so innocent. Tell us what you have done for years on the field. Yeah, well... Um, the Lord really called me to uh, lead young men and, and teach them how to be good leaders in our community and become something more than what they currently are. And I took that to heart, and I promised God I, I would, you know, give him the glory. Every, every game, I would go and kneel on the 50-yard line and, you know, give thanks for the opportunity to lead these young men. And, yeah, I did that for eight years, and... Some of the kids started showing up and saying, hey, we're believers, can we join you? I said, heck yeah, this is America, absolutely. <laughs> Somebody saw us doing that that was new to the area, one of the administrators, and they said, went over to the high school principal and said, have you seen what the permanent football program is really doing? So he told me that I was not allowed to pray with the kids, and if I, had, if I wanted to pray, I had to wait till every single person has changed and left and been turned over to their parents. And I had to go and pray in the middle of the night, out on the 50, all alone. And the constitutional lawyers they, uh, at Liberty Institute, they said, you know, hey, they can't, they can't do this. They cannot take away your rights as an American. And I said, fine, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go pray on the 50. So I did. <laughs> Uh, so with the school, that with, with their uh, lawyers, they said that, um, yeah, I was suspended now because I, I would not agree to what they said. They said that I could go as far as, oh, you can pray. You could pray, you know, that is your right as an American, but we don't want you to do it where the public can see you. So we could put you in a room somewhere where nobody else can see what you're actually doing, which... I'm an American, and I love God. I mean, that's who I am. Amen. Thank you. Let's give God glory for and also thank these fine heroes <laughs> for what they have done. Thank you.
When Ted came to me last summer about our decision to have him run for President of the United States, we prayed and thought about it deeply. With that prayer, it came to me that he should be in this race because this is an important time in our country culturally. And I believe that Ted has some unique qualities and talents that can make a big difference for all Americans in this particular time. When I realized that it was God's calling that I participate for our country, I knew that he was asking that my part be to show his face to everyone that we meet, to this country. And that is a face of love and of freedom and of individual liberty. Ted and I have been blessed with two little girls. Caroline is seven and Catherine just turned five. Last week, Caroline had to write two sentences in her geography class about her country. And I sat with her at the dining room table and she drew a beautiful map of the United States. I was very proud that she did it quite well by now. And she wrote in second grade handwriting all by herself with no words from mom. I am from the United States of America. There are a lot of people who want to live here. And I love that second graders in this country know that the first sentence that they should write is how proud they are to be from here and that they are blessed by the grace of God to be from here and that there are so many other children around this world who crave that blessing and what an honor and responsibility they have because of what God has given us. And I know that Ted can keep it that way. Ted has stood up for our fund fundamental freedoms over and over again, and he's won. Rather than me recounting them, which you can read about in a document called A Proven Record, it's on our website, let me show you a few clips that demonstrate some of the most important elements of his fight for you. When no one else would take on Washington. Who actually has stood up not just to Democrats, but to leaders in our own party. Ted Cruz has led the fight. When millions of Americans rose up against Obamacare, I was proud to lead that fight. When millions of Americans rose up against amnesty, I was proud to lead that fight. When millions of Americans rose up against Planned Parenthood, I was proud to lead that fight. And in the struggle to defend our religious liberty. If we lose our religious liberty, we lose every freedom in America. Ted Cruz can be trusted to lead the fight. Religious freedom is and always has been central to the American experience. It cuts across class lines, racial lines, ethnic lines, party lines. It unifies us. It is who we are as an American people. Leadership you can trust. God bless the United States of America. Each of these heroes have chosen to follow a higher power, and that is the God of Abraham, Moses, of, and David. That is the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus Christ. We should remember Reverend Mar Martin Luther King's letter in 1963, the letter from a Birmingham jail. The opening words were, my fellow clergymen, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the Apostle Paul left the village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world. So I am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. The words of a pastor standing up and speaking the truth and being willing to be thrown in jail for it. Another example at another pivotal moment in our nation's history, Ronald Reagan. The Gipper went to Notre Dame, a university with a tremendous Christian heritage. And Reagan spoke not only of his personal faith, but of America's belief in God as the source of all strength. He told the cheering students that the West was not going to contain communism but rather transcend it. 
and he called communism a bizarre chapter in human history whose last pages even now are being written. America is a fundamentally center-right nation built on Judeo-Christian values. That's who we were in 1776, and it is who we are today. Actually, Jefferson told us, when the people fear their rulers, there is tyranny. And when the rulers fear the people, there is liberty. If I might humbly suggest a cruise corollary to that. Liberty is never safer than when politicians are terrified. Let me give some simple and rather stunning numbers. In the United States of America, there are roughly 90 million self-described evangelical Christians. About 30% of our population. In the last presidential election, 2012, 54 million evangelicals stayed home. A majority of evangelicals did not vote. Now, is it any wonder we have the government we have? Is it any wonder we have the leaders we have when believers stay home and unbelievers are selecting the leaders of this country? If you wonder why the federal government wages a daily assault on life, on marriage, on religious liberty, it's because Christians are not standing up for our values. Christians are staying home. Well, mark my words, we will stay home no longer. So I ask that you, number one, pray. I ask that you, number two, stand up. Stand up today. Say, we will not go quietly and give up our great nation. When I was a kid, my father said to me over and over again, when we faced oppression in Cuba, I had a place to flee to. If we lose our freedom here, where do we go? That is why we're all here, and I want to ask my father, Pastor Rafael Cruz, to come up and say a final word. You know, we've been hearing many pastors, and rightly so, that we must start with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name, that's not the heathen, that's us, that's the body of Christ, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Yes, we must start with prayer. But prayer is only half the equation. The second part of the equation is 2 Corinthians 5.20 which says that we are ambassadors for Christ. That means we are God's representatives here on earth. We are God's hands, we are God's feet, we are God's mouthpiece, and Jesus said, shout it from the housetops. What happened in the 1700s was a dual revival, spiritual and political revival, all tied into one, and I believe that's what's about to happen in America again, a spiritual and a political revival. Father God, thank you for these men and women who love you. Thank you for the believers on this stage. Thank you for the men and women gathered here in this congregation. Thank you for the men and women on the internet and across the state of South Carolina and across the country and across the world who love you and who love Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity of each of us, every one of us in this congregation, to be here serving at such a time as this. We thank you, Lord, that we were put in a position to serve, not at a time where the stakes didn't matter, not at a time when liberty was safe, but at a time when our nation was in peril, that we could have the opportunity to rise up and awaken others, to hear the truth, to speak the truth, and together to save this great nation that has been blessed from you from the founding times. We thank you for your wisdom, your glory, your grace, and we pray in your heavenly Son's name.
Jesus Christ.